Welcome back to the Our Invite Podcast. My name is Nima. My name is Aaron. And today we're joined by a very special guest, Dr. DePero, the author of the textbook Pharmacotherapy, a Pathophysiology Approach, and also the Dean at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Pharmacy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nima. It's my pleasure. And I uh, want to make one correction. So the book is 200 people. I'm one of the editors. So there are many people involved in that. And uh, d- get more credit than I deserve, but it's a lot of people that come together to, to make that book. For sure. Well, Dr. DePier, we just want to thank you for taking the time out and being here with us today. Can you tell uh, the viewers a little bit about yourself? Well, as Neven mentioned, I'm Dean at Virginia Commonwealth School of Pharmacy, and I've been here six years. Uh, before that, I was Dean down in South Carolina in the combined program, the Medical University of South Carolina and the University of South Carolina And before that, I spent a lot of years at the University of Georgia and the Medical College of Georgia. Uh, I've always been in academia. In my career, I started out as a um, faculty member, but also clinical pharmacist on surgery, general surgery and critical care, and did that for many years before getting into administration. So you said you've been in academia for a long time. What made you want to stay in academia and not do the, I guess, the clinical um, practicing part of the pharmacy world? Well, for me, when I got into academia, I, I wanted to be um, a clinical practitioner. And so, as I said, in, in, in general surgery, <laughs> but I also wanted to do research, clinical mm-hmm. research and laboratory-based research. And so that gave me the opportunity to do that. Now, when I started out, I was uh, interested in teaching, but what I learned over the years is that I became much more interested in teaching, and that has become an uh, even more highly valued part of what I did for many years. Now, as dean, I do some teaching. Most weeks, I'm, I'm uh, involved with students doing things, but not nearly as much classroom teaching as I once had, but I've really enjoyed that as well. So, I think about... Um, you know, an academic career, and what it allowed me to do was uh, not only be a practitioner, but to be involved in research, which I really enjoyed, in scholarship, and writing, and and also uh, teaching. So, so how important is it for you to to mentor the upcoming generations of future pharmacists? How 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 much does do you, do you take that seriously? Very seriously, and in fact, um, as time has gone on, you really get a different perspective on it now. And uh, as I approach retirement years, I realize that's probably the most important thing that I do now and have done because I'm not going to be here forever. And so being involved in the, um, the career progress of people who are going to be the next generation and be the next deans and department chairs and faculty to be involved with their career development is really important. So well, let's talk about a little bit about pharmacy and the pharmacy world. Um, why do you think the stigma that pharmacists just count pills and fill prescriptions has been around for so long? And what do we need to do as, per, as our, in our profession to change that? Yeah, um, you know, it, it still is the mindset for some people that that's all that pharmacists do is dispense medicines. But that's what we've done for hundreds of years. You know, this is, this is a long tradition. And um, In a way, we don't want to give that up, but we want to be able to do other things. We still, as pharmacists, want to assure uh, that that medications are properly administered, the patients have the right uh, education and advice, uh, assuring the safety of the supply chain of medicines. All that's really important. So we don't want to be completely dissociated from that part of it, but what we want to do is make... uh, the other more patient-oriented roles of pharmacists more commonplace. So anything now that you say, uh, it'd be great if pharmacists could do that, or great if pharmacists, they're doing it. It is happening. Our problem is that it's not consistent across all of pharmacy. There, and it, when you talk about the pharmacists of the future, they're out there right now. Mm-hmm. And in just about any kind of example you could name, it is happening. So what we've got to do is make it more consistent and then uh, get to a point where society views pharmacists differently. Some people do. They really understand what their pharmacist can do for them in their healthcare. 
and take full advantage of their pharmacist knowledge. And then other people really don't know, you know, it's, ah, I just get my medicines from the pharmacist. So yeah. it's that part of society. Um, we need to help them understand what a pharmacist can contribute to the healthcare. Once we get to a point, kind of a tipping point, where um, most of society thinks of pharmacists as people who help them solve problems with their medicines, then uh, we've really gotten to the point what, that we need to. You know, I've, I've, I've been a pharmacist now for 42 years. And in that time, it's hard to convey how much the profession has changed. I know at any point in time, it seems kind of static. Boy, we're, we're stuck in the mud. We're not, that's not the case when you look at the long term. Um, there are so many things going on in pharmacy that back decades ago, we, we talked about and, and said, boy, it'd be great if we could do this, great if we could do that. I mean, if I were to describe to you the first pharmacy that I worked in, it was a hospital pharmacy in my hometown, a small hospital, uh, and compare that with today, you'd be astounded at, at the changes. And so it's been mostly incremental, you know, over the time. And... Uh, when you take it in total, what has happened over the decades is really phenomenal. Now, we know there's still a long way to go, so we're not satisfied with where we are because we think that pharmacists can contribute so much more to healthcare. But if we look at how far it's come, it's really encouraging. And the types of jobs that pharmacists have, I mean, again, another thing that's really amazing to me is the various types of titles Mm -hmm. of jobs for pharmacists that weren't there 10 years, 20 years ago. Certainly not when I graduated pharmacy school. I, um, when I got out, it was fairly simple. Community pharmacy, hospital yes. pharmacy. That was pretty much it. And now you look across the spectrum of the jobs that people have as pharmacists uh, that, that aren't their traditional ones, that um, it's expanded greatly. They're great opportunities, but we still, again, you know, have have a long way to go. So you're touching on the changing landscape of pharmacy a lot. So how do you think, you know, the incorporation, automation, globalization, internet pharmacy, things like that will affect pharmacists and how can we use these changes to our benefit? Yeah. So, um, you know, if this relates to the supply of medicines or providing uh, the actual prescription, you know, this is something that um, we have to expect is going to be a continued change and that we should be a part of it, again, in assuring that the systems for dispensing medications are uh, of high quality and assuring safety. Um, the use of technicians, I mean, mail order, uh, yes, automation. So now, you know, there are pharmacists who are automation experts and um, there are there are some facilities, I'm thinking of some that are related to the federal government TRICARE system, you know, they fill hundreds of thousands of prescriptions per day. And it's, it's not because they've got dozens and dozens of pharmacists. They have relatively few pharmacists, many technicians and automation to be able to do this. And um, it's not something that pharmacists should, should be against because the trade-off is the less time that we as pharmacists have to spend putting tablets and capsules and bottles, the more time we have to do other things. And so what, what pharmacists do in that mix um, is change. We've got to be more adept at how to supervise uh, technicians, be a participant in the training of technicians so they're of high quality. We have got to be um, more adept uh, at the use of automation. So, you know, now there are pharmacists who are automation experts. Yeah. And, uh, know how these systems work. And not only um, the, the actual, could be robotics or other systems, but uh, how it connects with the, um, the data systems as well. And so, uh, you know, being, again, the transition for pharmacy is becoming more adept at supervising technicians, at um, using automation systems. Uh, the, 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 uh, the ways that we have it, filling prescriptions should be more efficient. And so it's not something we should stand in the way of, but think about how uh, the change in the time and effort that we put in is used for other purposes. 
Let's talk about the book, Pharmacotherapy. Um, we see it as the Bible of uh, the in pharmacy. That's our Bible. Um, so when was the time, I guess, um, do you, do you, have you realized how much of an impact that book has made on all the pharmacists that have come from studying from that book? And when was that time where you looked at yourself, I guess, in the mirror and realized that it was like, you know, this, this was successful. And did you ever expect it to have this big of an impact? Well, thank you. And this all started back in the early 80s. And at the time, uh, there wasn't a book of that same approach using the, the approach that we used. And so we thought there was a, a need for it. And, you know, as we talked to people um, in academia, they, they expressed this need. And so it was initially a, a really heavy lift. I mean, it's not something that even a few people could do. You really need a yeah. team of people. And so um, this was something that I learned early in my career is that uh, you could get the right people together and do something that any one person couldn't do. And it took a few years and finally, you know, got out there. So uh, again, uh, right now there are about 200 people who come together to put, put this book out, oh. editors and authors, and it can't be done with uh, any fewer than that. But we were lucky. So when we started out, there were relatively few PharmD programs that had not yet become all PharmD. So in the time, you know, starting in the early 80s, and it wasn't until 2000 that our U.S. programs became all PharmD. So that, the growth of um, PharmD programs, back then the national graduating class was probably five to 6,000. Now it's like 14,000. Um, growth of residency programs has been phenomenal, but also internationally. You know, when I, I get a chance... Um, in our pre-COVID era to meet with colleagues from around the world, we're all talking about the same things. You know, they're interested in advancing pharmacy education and uh, building uh, patient-oriented cl clinical types of services. And so the, the whole direction of pharmacy, so there's been a great expansion um, in patient care types of services, expansion in the U.S. So we, we, we're lucky that we got out ahead of that and kind of rode that wave as, as pharmacy changed, you know, we were there along with it. And we've made uh, many changes over the years. The latest, which, it, and this didn't come from us, it came from others, was construction of the pharmacist patient care process. So now we know that's got to be uh, more consistently applied and taught in our programs. And so that's something the late, last edition you know, that we've incorporated into it. So there's continual change um, now to the point where we do still have print books, but the usage is is 90% plus online. I think true for, yeah. true for most uh, sources of information and data. And that's been a big change as well. And um, probably yourselves, like our students, we don't expect that they would just use pharmacotherapy that having access to uh, so many things online that as a, to be, be a competent practitioner, you have to ac yeah. access to a lot of different sources of information and pharmacotherapy is just one of those. Correct. So in an interview with Pharmacy Time four years ago, um, you alluded to the fact that students need to put themselves in, pos in positions to fulfill lifelong learning. Can you speak more on that and what your message was? Yeah, uh, I think the main thing is that now, ever, even more than ever, students coming out of pharmacy school have to think that what they learned will, will is a short half-life. You know, it's not going to get you through 30 years. And this was sort of the mindset when I graduated. Now, I BS in pharmacy in 1978 and, and PharmD program after that. But in 1978, most of us graduated and thought, boy, we had, we had learned it all. We were, we were good for a few decades, you know, and and, um, and, and a lot of people thought we didn't have to go back to school, didn't have to learn new things. Now, again, of all the changes, it would be difficult for me to tell you how irrelevant all the things are that I learned or how many mm. of the medicines that now are common use weren't there. It's, it's just uh, amazing how many diseases, particularly infectious diseases, we never heard about or talked about. And so... Um, the, the, the key is that um, it will continue to develop. It will continue to change. And, you've, you, I mean, you hear about lifelong learning. It's just essential. You can, you can not do that, 
and become irrelevant over time, or you can commit to continued learning, we don't really know what the next things will be that pharmacists have to learn, but to be receptive to that. And it's not that you have to learn everything that comes out there, but what field are you working in? What type of pharmacy do you practice? And what is it you need to know to be at the forefront of your practice? So um, I think that's, that's really the message that uh, you have to count on it changing and to be to be, still be a, uh, a competent healthcare practitioner, you have to stay ahead of it. So you spoke about um, international travels that you've done pre-COVID. Um, you traveled to UAE, Indonesia. You've given talks at all these college of pharmacies. How, what have you learned from going into those um, other countries? What have you learned in regards to pharmacy? And do you think that those international travels is needed from people like yourself and along your colleagues um, to like, expand pharmacy? It is necessary and helpful. You know, it's a shame. Um, this month, coming up in September, we were supposed to go to the uh, FIP, which is the International mm -hmm. Pharmacy Federation in Spain, and not only a nice place to visit, but uh, to be able to see international colleagues uh, is a chance that's it's missed. We'll have some virtual programs, uh, but not nearly as good as being able to meet with colleagues. Well, what I find in going to um, the different countries I've had a chance to go to this year, I was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, is that we're, again, we're talking the same language. Uh, that while there is a variation in practice in pharmacy that does exist within countries, a lot of the agenda is the same. We, ha we have commonality in the problems with medicines. You know, you think of all the, the the problems from the cost of medicines to adherence to uh, assuring quality of supply chain, many other things. These are common problems across country borders that we all have that pharmacists should be uh, actively working to solve. And so that's a commonality that we share. Uh, also, in just about every part of the world, pharmacists and pharmacy educators are working to advance the profession to become more patient oriented. So all the things that we're talking about related to um, clinical pharmacy, I mean, any, really any term you can use, it's an active part of the discussion and development in other countries around the world related to pharmacy. So again, the variation, and I think that um, some countries could have a great advantage over what's going on here in the U.S., because they see what the opportunities are and can kind of leapfrog that. We, you know, we took decades to get to where we are in other countries, seeing what the goals are could uh, achieve that in a lot quicker time. So there's a lot of commonality. Uh, for me personally, um, I learn things from my colleagues in different parts of the world. It's a um, continual communication. It, it, it's not quite every day, but a lot of days and certainly every week, I'm having communications with uh, friends who are colleagues in pharmacy around the world. And from time to time, we get to um, uh, exchange, you know, have visits, exchange students to come back and forth. Mm -hmm. And this just creates further, uh, further colleagueship that will go on to the years ahead. So those are some of the things that I think about or that I see this, this common agenda that we have in pharmacy across many countries. From, from all the countries that you've visited, which country do you think is the most, I guess, progressive? Which one is the one closest to getting pharmacists, um, you know, what we've been fighting for? Well, there's a lot of um, advanced practice in Europe. And um, so I probably couldn't uh, well summarize all the things that are going on at a very high level yeah. in the UK, in France, in Spain, other places around. Uh, certainly, Australia has had uh, very advanced pharmacy practice for many years. Now, the, uh, some of the other areas around the world where um, they're making uh, great strides and really at a high level of practice is uh, the Gulf area. So, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, yes, UAE, Kuwait, and with that, um, I know that um, some, some areas in the Middle East, again, are uh, 
are making great strides. So pharmacy education is changing rapidly. The practice of pharmacy, there are examples of advanced practices in places like uh, Jordan and Lebanon and Egypt, yeah. um, in Turkey for sure. So uh, this is what I think, uh, think about as well as um, many examples in Asia. You know, there's been for many years now an Asian uh, uh, conference, an Asian college of clinical pharmacy. And I've been to a couple of those meetings on here about all the great things going on in various Asian countries as well. So it's, it's really widespread. I think there are certainly some areas of the world and some countries that are behind that, uh, that hopefully will, will progress further in terms of practice, but there are just so many areas that are at a high level, you know, know what the goal is. No, I mean, we're, we, we have the same goals. Exactly. And they're actively um, working in that direction and reaching a high level of practice. So here in the U.S., we're moving more towards the value-based care, uh, value-based model of healthcare, um, and so it's been shown that pharmacies significantly increase better patient outcomes as well as save money for the healthcare system. So why do you think it has been such a struggle for pharmacists to attain more autonomy and get more incentivized in the healthcare setting? Uh, it, right, it has been a struggle. This, this has been going on again for so long, for as long as I've been in pharmacy, and um, there have been some important changes. And uh, value-based care is one example of something that really works um, in pharmacy's favor. I mean, if, if, if you're promoting value-based care, an answer to a lot of the issues and the goals you want to achieve are having more pharmacists and having them in key areas. Uh, you know, with, with a struggle, I agree, there have been struggles. Again, uh, the advances that have been made are really phenomenal. If you look at health systems, a typical health system that has, so clinical specialists and people in operations and clinics related to health systems that have expanded, most big health systems have doubled to tripled their pharmacy staff in the last decade. There are so many more patient-oriented pharmacists. I'm, if I look out my window here to the right, I'm looking at VCU Health System, and the, the hospital is right here. And the people who they have working in patient air, care areas, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's grown dramatically. Now, that's not based on fee-for-service. Yeah. Some of that is based on um, hospital billing, Medicare Part A, that the fees that come to the hospital. And it, it is based partly on um, value-based systems. One big advance that um, we've been able to make is that a number of years ago, one way we would talk about it was that, you know, we need to get to the hospital administrators and help them understand what pharmacists can do. They are there. When I talk to the CEO and the COO of the hospital here, and I think it's like a lot of other places, they know, they can, they can get out ahead of me and talk about what pharmacists can contribute. And I think that I've got to um, inform them about something and, and the next thing they'll be, again, three steps ahead in saying yeah. how great pharmacists are and doing this and that. And th so that's not the issue anymore. Uh, but we have to realize that in any health system, you know, the VA is another great example. That's a that's, in a way, a managed care value-based yep. system, not a fee-for-service system. And pharmacists have made great strides uh, under, under that system in helping and promoting care. So um, the kinds of decisions are the, the more complicated decisions that administrators have to make when you think about, okay, you, you have a resource, financial resource, X millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, and in that mix, You've got to decide how many nurses, how many pharmacists, how many PAs and neurosurgeons. And, um, and, and sometimes the answer is we need more of something else in addition to pharmacists. So it's not, it's not that pharmacists aren't um, considered in these decisions. It, it just uh, difficult administrative decisions that have to be made in light of uh, relatively scarce resources. Again, um, I think there's a lot more that could be done. However, we've come a long way. And a lot of what pharmacists do, are doing right now are in 
value-based payment systems or other types of managed care systems and not the fee for service. You know, we're all, we were all pushing for pharmacist provider status. Yeah. And with that, it's important to realize how limited that success would have been in just, uh, again, fee for service or the yeah. old type of system in Medicare and um, not apply to so many other uh, ways that, that healthcare is financed. So um, I, I think that uh, the expansion of health insurance, expansion of Medicaid systems, expansion of value-based care has been a big plus for pharmacists because um, again, whether it's safety or chronic disease management or keeping people out of, out of hospitals, uh, clearly pharmacists can do that. And those who are making the decisions about healthcare are, are, have realized it. So you speak a lot on managed care. Can you explain then how much of an impact MTM services can have um, within um, the healthcare setting for pharmacists? Yeah, it's, it's clearly part of the overall uh, profile of what pharmacists need to do. And um, this, this is something that, uh, you know, is a, it should be kind of a local determinant as to how much of pharmacist time and effort is put into, if it's traditional MTM, if it's complex medication management. I mean, the thinking now is we really ought to be shifted to more complex medication management. So defining what that is, what's the, uh, the patient profile, how do pharmacists get connected to patients with that profile to be of help. We, uh, there are probably a lot of routine things that um, maybe others can address and, uh, and even, even some relatively simple things that can have a big impact like medication reconciliation within a health system are important. And it isn't always that pharmacists have to do it because there's some, uh, some what we would call clinical services that even technicians can do because they're, they can be properly trained to, to do that and free up pharmacist time for more complex things. So um, MTM has to be a part of the overall suite of what pharmacists offer, but what, what that mix is in com comparison with other uh, functions, again, complex patient management, med rec, uh, chronic disease management is, is something that a, um, a particular system or a locale or clinic would determine what that proper mix is. Back in uh, 2017, you made this statement, and I quote, uh, clinical pharmacists need to develop consistent clinical practice models so that patients and other healthcare practitioners know what to expect from pharmacists. Where do you think we stand now in 2020, and have we made any of that progress? Well, there is a long way to go. So this is a uh, problem that pharmacists have had for a long time, that, that those who even pharmacists sometimes don't know what to expect. And, and these are comparisons that other people have made and probably st stated a lot more uh, eloquently is, you know, you can go to a primary care physician, you can go to a dentist, you can go to a physical therapist, and you know what to expect. I mean, it, there can be some variations, but you, you know when you go into a dentist's office what kind of services you're going to get. Other than providing the prescription, most people don't know what to expect from a pharmacist. And so um, part of the reason is because we have had inconsistent models. For a long time, the clinical practice of pharmacy was focused on uh, other providers, you know, that we would think we're doing a good job if we're keeping the physicians happy and the nurses happy and doing what they need. And, and uh, along the way, that got shifted that not that uh, our physician or nursing colleagues would be any less important, but shifted to realize the focus of our service should be the patient. And, um, and, and so this is still a work in progress that um, has been going on for, you know, for a long time and, and really won't be um, realized until we have a consistent model. So uh, others have put together again, the pharmacist patient care process as a sort of a foundation for a practice model. In the meantime, 
we have got uh, a lot of different types of models, clinical specialist models. We've got uh, consultant models. Their collaborative practice arrangements of various types in the states. And so while some of these are very good and advanced practice, again, it's a type of inconsistency that, um, that doesn't allow us to uh, provide pharmacist care on a broad basis, on a, on a consistent basis. You know, so when you have this, then I think we have a bit of confusion within the profession it certainly, you, you could probably attest to this, gets confusing for our pharmacy students. Well, you know, what is the model? How do we yeah. do this? When I get out, what, what's the model that I'll use? <laughs> it gets difficult to explain it to our colleagues in other health professions and to administrators. You know, what is it exactly? Even though they, they have uh, often a positive impression, um, other healthcare providers or administrators, what pharmacists do, it's not always a consistent uh, impression. So by having this model, it doesn't mean that all pharmacists will do it the same way because the model is really a primary care model. Yeah. And so uh, of the pharmacists working in primary care, yes, that would be good if we had a consistent model, but we realize that that may not fit for the person working as an um, uh, uh, infectious disease stewardship pharmacist or an oncology specialist or, you know, an IT pharmacist. It's not going to fit there, even though that person yeah. is doing things that support clinical services. So it would be, it's good that we have it, that we're uh, teaching about it, that we're putting it into practice. And uh, I think it'll be helpful across a good segment of our pharmacy practice. I think you, what you just said right there was perfect is that like a lot of pharmacy students are confused. Also, they don't know what to do when they get out. So do you think that one leader in the pharmacy community is missing that one organization that is the voice and it's leading us all where we follow them? I think Dr. Scott Knorr, the CEO of APHA is doing a very good job with that right now. He's very active on social media, you know, really fighting for the profession. Um, do you think that's what we need to really help us, you know, get everyone on one, one boat? Well, it might make it a little bit simpler. I don't think that's our biggest problem or a big problem. Um, in fact, over as the decades have gone by, it seems to me like our major organizations have the same agenda. There's some little differences, but um, mm -hmm. they've all come to um, fully support patient care roles for pharmacists and uh, have come together on a lot of things that the pharmacist care uh, primary care process is one example. Other uh, key foundational definitions about pharmacists, the future of pharmacy, there's a lot of, lot of similar thought on this. So, you know, I'd have trouble right now um, thinking about some major direction where there's a difference between APHA and ASHP and ACCP and uh, some other organizations. They're pretty much on the same page. Yeah. So, while it might, yeah, it might be great to have if we had one organization and um, combine all the resources, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to happen anytime in the next few years. But I do believe that the organizations are pretty much on the same page when it comes to advancing the role of pharmacists in the healthcare system. And so uh, for the vast majority of uh, initiatives that we're trying to put forward, they're, they're pushing in the same direction. So I don't think that's the major issue or problem that we have in pharmacy right now. And you look at other professions, they're at least as divided. Uh, the, the AMA certainly doesn't represent the majority of physicians and there are countless number of physician related organizations, even more so than we have in pharmacy. So again, I, I'm not viewing that as our okay. major issue or problem at, at this time. So we're speaking a lot about pharmacists. In, in terms of healthcare in general, what is the major shift that you want to see happen within the next couple of years Do you think that will lead us to better healthcare? Well, you know, in the whole debate, I, now it's become so much political. Um, and I have to tell you, I don't think like, a, you know, a red pharmacist or a blue pharmacist. I think like a pharmacist, what's going to, 
what's going to provide better care to more people in this country? And I'm, I support systems. I, I do believe, I don't have all the answers for sure, um, but I do believe that um, there should be universal health care. And, you know, people talk about Medicare for all. I think there's a lot that would have to be worked out if, if that were going to be the case. Um, and, uh, but it should be a right and not a privilege. And people should not have to suffer because they don't have health insurance. So I believe that the federal government and the states, and so much of it is at the state level, do need to step up to assure that every citizen has got uh, health care and, um, and in financial backing, whether that's insurance or other mechanisms, so that they're not under the threat of having uh, inferior care or no care because they can't afford it. Uh, so I think that, you know, in that scenario, there's a lot that pharmacists can do. Expansion of health care will open up opportunities. And it's not just because more medicines will be used. It's because there are a, a lot of problems with medicines. And uh, these are problems that we can address and solve on an individual basis or system basis. So again, I, I really would like to see our country go to more, um, uh, ex more accessible health care uh, in, in, you know, one way or another. Again, when um, politicians talk about Medicare for all, I'm not sure really what that means because you don't really hear all the details. Uh, I certainly know about Medicare and how the, but it's, um, you probably should know Medicare is not a free system. Exactly. <laughs> that there are a lot of, not only somebody's paying for, but even people who are receiving Medicare often have to pay a lot of money out of their resources to maintain that benefit. So when we're, when we're speaking with uh, people, even it would be at schools or to professors, we always hear, oh, the market is saturated. Like, you know, you, you better study hard. You better do this because the market is saturated. But then when we speak to people like yourself, they're like, there's so many uh, job opportunities and we see that there's, there's so many different titles that a pharmacist can hold. Why do you think we're keep being told by other people that the market is saturated when there's so many job opportunities, there's so many new titles that come in with the professional pharmacy? Well, I, I agree. We should be optimistic. There are a lot of opportunities and it is uh, opportunities are opening up all the time. However, it, we are in a situation, uh, there's not one thing you can say about the job market and pharmacy that applies across the board. Um, we know that in traditional community practice, there is consolidation. And so it could be stores that are closing, um, you know, or, or merge, merging of some chains and all this is going on. There's no question about it. So if you're a traditional community pharmacist, particularly in chain pharmacy, um, the opportunities have become fewer. No one expects that community pharmacy, even traditional community pharmacy is gonna go away. But people have been predicting, this, the situation we have now, people have been predicting, it's in writing. There are articles that been written about this 20 years ago, you know, that come this day. <laughs> in fact, one article I'm thinking about that was published 20 years ago was written describing the year 2020. And, uh, and they stated that we would need, at that time, about two-thirds of the pharmacists working in uh, providing prescriptions, so traditional retail pharmacy, compared with what was there. That's, that's, we're not even contracted that much, but it's a world that um, you know, we're, we're, we're beginning to experience. And so um, while that is happening, in other directions, jobs are opening up you know, in, 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 in so many different areas. So not only, um, you know, health system types of drug, clinical specialists, but ambulatory care pharmacists. Uh, you know, I'm just amazed at the titles of jobs that are out there now. When I talk to my um, health system friends who are health system directors, and they've got pharmacists who are 340B pharmacists, and not only, you know, informatics, analytics pharmacists, automation pharmacists, supply chain pharmacists, on and on. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the need for people in so many different areas has increased that, uh, you know, managed care has opened up a lot. I have a son who's a pharmacist and 
was never really interested in the clinical part of pharmacy, but he was interested from day one in the business of pharmacy. While he was a PharmD student, he got his uh, MBA and uh, he's been working in the managed care world and, and doing what he enjoys, but it's quite different from what other people would, yeah. would like to do um, because it's more management, business, administration, and the financial aspects. Uh, you know, we've got pharmacists. If, if a pharmacist now could be um, really adept at, uh, at electronic data systems, so again, maybe that's the informatics analytics yeah. pharmacist. Maybe it's it's in, in a different way, but you, you match that up with uh, being a pharmacist and being good at electronic data systems. You know, you can pretty much go anywhere and uh, the, the, the need is out there. There are a lot of a other areas where that's the case. So, you know, here's the world we're living in. And we do get, um, we do communicate with, I do hear from, there are a number of our alums who are, traditional community pharmacists who have seen their employment opportunities contract. And so, um, uh, you know, rightly so, they're talking about this and people hear about it and, and it is going on in that sector of pharmacy while at the same time opening up wide in other areas. And it, it's a kind of change that's, um, that's, that's disconcerting. You know, if it were always the way it always was, you know, maybe uh, maybe we wouldn't be as anxious about it, but yeah. because it's in the midst of change, you know, we have to think about it differently. We have to think about how we train pharmacists differently and prepare them for the future. So uh, all of the things that you know and learn about, again, informatics, personalized medicine, uh, learning about how how uh, healthcare is financed is important. I mean, that's something that most pharmacists in the past, you could just ignore. I don't care how the, you know, where the money comes from. I just do my job. Not yeah. going to work in the future. We've got to understand the financing mechanisms and work within those systems. And, and it's partly because um, in the U S there's so many different systems. Again, there's, there's no yeah. one thing you can say about healthcare financing that applies across the system. We're not, uh, a UK or some other country that's got a, you know, one type of system that applies across uh, most of healthcare. Yeah. So we have to understand, you know, how it operates differently in the veterans affairs system, or what's the mix of financing in a uh, public uh, academic center like ours, or, you know, private hospitals. It just, um, I wish it were simple. It's not. But again, I think the opportunities are there. They are there. And again, if, if you look at um, the bigger trends, I think they work in the favor of pharmacy and the need for pharmacists. We're not spending less on medicines. You know, if you look at the trends and the, the really billions of dollars spent on medicines, you know, it's been increasing each year and then even more so with specialty medicines. You look at um, if they had solved all the problems with medicines, maybe we could turn the yeah. lights off and go home. Not happening. You know, yeah. you're still, you talk to anybody who takes medicines. They've got problems with medicines yeah. from remembering to take it to maybe they have some sort of effect from it, the undesirable effect to how do they afford it? Uh, drug shortages. How do I get it? I can't get it. You know, it's a uh, you know, long list of problems that aren't solved and aren't going to be solved and need, need our attention. Uh, you look at the prevalence of chronic disease, you know, increasing in our society and combine that with one, that, um, that many people with chronic diseases don't get good health care. So if you have diabetes, and you're getting good care, yeah, yeah. you're among the fortunate few. Most people don't have good care. Yeah. And we realize that for a lot of chronic conditions, um, lifestyle management is, is uh, wellness is a key thing. You know, uh, exercise, non-smoking, yeah. weight reduction, uh, immunization that can keep people from needing medicines. But as it happens, uh, you know, many people, because they have chronic disease, need medicines. That's the primary way that's managed. And we're the yeah. drug experts. And we're, we are well positioned as a profession to manage chronic diseases. 
And now um, in a lot of states, the practice laws are opening up uh, in such a way that allow pharmacists to do that and meet these un, unmet needs. So, you know, those are some big picture things, but, but what it comes down to circle around back to the question, it, it doesn't mean that every pharmacist is going to guarantee a job for life doing whatever they want to do. You know, the, the landscape is shifting. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity there for sure. And um, it, it just something we've, we've got to be more adept at, seeing what the needs are and how we can work within the healthcare systems that we have to provide care. Yeah. So let's say you, you have a situation where you, you're, you're a state legislature and you have the opportunity to draft a bill and, on healthcare. What are, what are some things that you are making sure you put in that bill that you want to get passed? Well, we had a big year here in Virginia uh, and there were three key, key things, three key bills that got passed that were in the works for a good number of years. And they're examples of the kinds of things that um, would help pharmacists be better care providers. So one was uh, more on the financial side and related to PBM transparency. And so I don't think we want to get into that whole mess, <laughs> but that's important too, you know, and how um, – uh, prescription prescription reimbursement. The second was related to technician training and set standards for that ha will be worked out. Now, sometimes um, in a uh, state level bill, th the wording is such that these groups will get together and write these regs, okay? So, um, but the general direction is greater training for technicians and technician standards. So this is an important advance. And then the um, third thing was expanded uh, authorization for pharmacists. And I don't think there's anything that ever happens that, you know, gives pharmacists every um, opportunity that they wish that they had and are trained to do. It, it comes in incremental steps. And so uh, in Virginia this year, there was kind of a, we call it a scope of practice bill but really authorization bill didn't, didn't expand the Pharmacy Practice Act, but gave pharmacists authority for initially a large number of things. And then that got whittled down that uh, now there are a few things going on. Examples, um, not only expanding uh, immunization, um, but also uh, like smoking cessation, oral contraceptive prescribing, um, uh, fluoride treatments. There are a few others that that are pushing out, you know, these boundaries of how pharmacists can contribute. And uh, we're in the process now of writing the regulation. So there's no ideal bill. Um, it's something that in the battle never really ends. You know, uh, there are opponents to this. So in the measures that I talked about, there are uh, certainly parts of the industry that are opposed. Sometimes uh, other healthcare provider organizations are concerned because they think it's their territory, don't really understand how pharmacists, in, in our example, pharmacists would work even more closely with prescribers, physicians in particular, to offer these services. So, um, you know, so it has to have receptive legislators it has to involve the cooperation of the other health, uh, health professions, societies, you know, to, to go along with that. And, um, you know, we've been able to make the case to some extent that if pharmacists could do these things, that it would improve and enhance the services that, that other primary care providers could, could offer. Um, so, again, you know, I have to say there's no ideal bill. Now, another uh, thing that should, should open up in most states is even though, even though pharmacists are not in the federal Social Security Act as providers, they can still be recognized at the state level as providers. And so that's a, you know, a state uh, level effort that has to happen is getting pharmacists to, to be able to be reimbursed for approved services within their scope of practice through state Medicaid. So 
you had mentioned earlier <clears throat> how a lot of seminars and stuff are online now before it was in person. You said it wasn't the virtual thing is not the same, which I agree. And uh, me and Aaron do webinars with two undergrad students that are trying to get into professional programs. And, you know, the other day we did one at University of Central Florida. And the common question was, how do we connect with the people? How do we network with the people? We're, we're doing everything through online. And I want to bring that to that question to you. Um, for the pharmacy student, your pharmacy students, a lot of things are online. Events are online. Um, even for pharmacists, the CE dinners, that was, a t that was a time maybe you can connect with your fellow, you know, colleagues how would you what's your um advice into connecting networking as i'm sure you know networking is a key thing in life um how do you go about doing that through the virtual aspect of things well it it's a great question it's so, something that we're all working on uh you know we're all trying to figure that out so how do we have a personal connection in a uh a zoom environment <laughs> uh there's no ideal. I mean, we, we all know, and no question about it, we would be able to connect so much easier in person. So how right. do we make the best of the situation that we've got? Um, I think that, uh, I think there'll be a lot of creativity that comes forward from the experience that we're having. I'm, I'm expecting that in the months ahead, as I attend uh, AACP meetings, American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, I'll be hearing from faculty colleagues at other institutions who have great ideas about here's what they've done. And, and there's some things here, you know, that we'll share as well. So I think we're just in the beginning of that right now. <clears throat> frankly, I think we're all trying to survive. How do we keep our schools open? How do we keep students learning? Um, it's, it's really content delivery that, uh, you know, we've got to keep going, struggling to, we are continuing with, with clinical rotations and other practice rotations to do that uh, and um, hope for a day in the future when we'll be able to get together again. So in the meantime, I think there, there are different approaches and some of that is small group approaches that people getting together by Zoom. We have, um, we, in the past here, our faculty would offer what they called fireside chats. Basically, many dozens over the course of the year were faculty members typically would invite, say, a half dozen students to their home. And it might be for a dinner, it might be for uh, dessert or something, or sit around, you know, in the living room or around the fireplace, just, just talk about whatever. No agenda, it wasn't a lecture of any sort. And it's something that our faculty and our students really enjoyed and are missing about the current environment. So we're, we're uh, reinstituting these fireside chats, even though they'll be by Zoom. So we'll keep them informal. Uh, people most likely be in the evening. You know, people be, everybody be at their, their homes in a different environment um, than, you know, sitting in front of, uh, yeah. like giving a lecture and uh, having the opportunity to, to talk with a small group of students. So, you know, it's not a one-off. It's something we've got to do consistently. We're putting into place some things right now. I'm, I'm most concerned about our P1 students who haven't, yet yeah, yeah. got to know yes. each other or the faculty. And so we're putting a lot more time and effort in connecting with them and engaging our P's, twos, twos, threes, and fours to interact with the P1s to help them socialize and get to know people in the school. So, um, I, you know, we don't have the ultimate answer. And we know that a completely remote experience is not ideal and is uh, – um, something we'll, we'll, we've got to have different in the future. But I do think we've learned so much about remote learning that the future isn't the past. The future is the ideal hybrid, a better hybrid of uh, the on, um, on site, the face to face, the connecting the personal with the convenience and the practicality of remote learning when it's most appropriate. Yeah. So I, I think we'll find a different combination of learning methodologies that'll make the best of uh, on-site, face-to-face, and remote. Yeah. Um, and I, I have to bring this up. So obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so how do you think pharmacists could better help uh, handle the current uh, COVID-19 situation and other healthcare providers as well?
I think that um, some of that is uh, becoming, you know, a source of knowledge and information. So taking it on as a personal goal that we as pharmacists are going to, to, to learn and know what there is to know about COVID in this example. And so we've all seen there's a lot of debate about information, misinformation, and not only um, immunization, but the types of medicines that have been used. And, you know, we're hearing about um, uh, unproven medicines that are being promoted in, in the social media. Where do people go to? Well, we need to be a trusted source. And, and so that means putting time and effort into understanding, learning, uh, what it is about COVID and what it is about testing and what, what is it about the types of medicines that are being proposed and um, steering people away from the dangerous or the unproven types of medicines and uh, being honest about, you know, treatments that might have some, some positive impact as well. So I think that's a fundamental thing. And, um, you know, not feeling like we're, we're, we're just in this or whatever happens. Be out in front, learning being a source of knowledge and information that we can share with our patients, I think is number one. And, um, you know, in this, uh, a lot of people have relied on pharmacies. Pharmacies have gotten more um, people into, if you think of community pharmacists, in, into the pharmacies than before. Yeah. So I think that's a big opportunity. The other is um, what's going to be a challenge this fall is immunization, not only for COVID, but for okay. influenza. Yeah. So expanding services there, making those available. And um, I, I think we're at a point, you know, there was a tipping point a couple of years ago where more immunizations were given in pharmacies than all other sites combined. Yeah. So it's, yeah. and that's, that's been incremental, but we're, we're at a point where most pharmacists should and could and should offer immunization services. Um, and I think along with that other, health and wellness services are important. So these are key, key things that are, again, fairly straightforward and simple, but it's a commitment that we've got to make. So I want to end it with a fun question. We asked this question to all of our guests. Um, if we were to go back to high school, even undergrad, and we were to speak to your best friends and uh, professors, who would they say Dr. DePiro was? We would go up to them and be like, who was Dr. DePiro? Who, what would they say? In high school? In high school and undergrad. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's different for me. So in high school, I was never a, um, a really focused student. And uh, there's so many things that were of more interest to me than what was going on in the classroom. And so I did okay. I you know, managed to get by. Uh, but it really wasn't until getting into the college experience, so even undergraduate and pharmacy school, that I applied – you know, what, what, what were my, I became focused and, and really put myself to it. And so um, became very interested in, I mean, just the science of it. And uh, for me, a great experience of one of many, well, a couple of things. And one was that um, I worked all throughout high school and pharmacy school in pharmacies, in hospital pharmacies. And I learned, uh, it, I probably learned more by working, you know, every weekend <laughs> and all summer than I did in pharmacy school and very practical kinds of things. And part of it was working with people, you know, working with pharmacists and technicians and learning about unit dose systems and computerization, and other, you know, all things that, um, that are challenging to learn as a pharmacy student. So that really gave me, uh, and I, I could see, uh, frankly, um, well, most, most of the people I work with, very professional. So I, I learned the, the best in terms of professionalism and at the same time would sometimes see examples of poor professional behavior, you know, and contrast those. And uh, it became clear, you know, what, who were the good professionals. And um, with that, you know, as a pharmacy student, I had the opportunity to work in a, a research lab. And, uh, you know, at one point, really feel like I was living like a scientist and doing, this was in a medicinal chemistry laboratory and synthesizing new drugs. And, and uh, you know, so many of us would grow up thinking, boy, it'd be great to be a scientist. Well, you know, turn around one day and you can be a scientist and, you know, work in a lab and do experiments. And so 
those were some key things that were a big shift for me, uh, particularly from high school and getting into the college and pharmacy school experience that, that motivated, motivated me for the, at that time, you know, to put in a lot of time and best effort and for the future. So I want, I want you to give one last message here. Um, so we have a test on Friday and our teacher, we're learning on Parkinson's and schizo and our teacher really praises your book. Shout out to Dr. Ray. He said, go read the DePero chapters and you'll, you'll do fine on the test. What is your message to all the uh, professors and doctors that uh, utilize your um, book to teach? And also, what's your message to all the students on Friday that are going to be taking this test? They're really depending on your chapters on that textbook <laughs> ah. for their grade. Well, thank you. Uh, one, I have to say, the farm, uh, Parkinson's chapter is not one that I edit. And so, oh, okay. uh, you all will know a lot more than I do about <laughs> Parkinson's. <laughs> by reading the chapter and taking the test and going to your lectures. So there's not any advice I can give you about Parkinson's. Um, <laughs> but I guess, uh, you know, the difficulty with any kind of textbook and ours included is uh, these are long chapters. They're difficult to read. I, I personally would have a tough time reading a chapter in an evening and staying focused for all of that and not falling asleep. And, you know, it's just tough to do. Um, so I think a, a good approach is, is go at it, not, not necessarily just to read from first to end word, but th think about have, uh, you know, cases that you're looking or problems or questions that you're trying to find the answers to. And if it's related to treatment of Parkinson's disease, so you've got a question in mind that you're, you're trying to answer, uh, you know, as you get into the material, because it's very thick, and, and so I, I think the best way is to go about it with a need. I need to know something. I need to understand something better and have, um, sometimes it's your lecture or a course objectives that can guide you. And, um, you know, it depends on the emphasis of the uh, instructor as well and the things that they've emphasized. So it would be natural that there are parts of that chapter, or any chapter that are less important. Yeah. And other parts that are more important and to know that difference because you, you, none of us can memorize it all, know it all. You really have to be selective and you can do that based on, again, a, what it is you need to know. Yeah. And what's your message to the professors and all doctors that all, um, utilize your book to teach? Well, uh, probably just that. Again, I, I can't give them advice in the clinical areas because they'll know more than I do. Okay but in the way that they use it. Again, a need to know, setting up, you know, uh, uh, say cases or okay, questions okay. that it. based on those to go back to the book is a better way to learn than just saying, read the chapter. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I know you're a very, very busy man, especially now with the whole pandemic. I'm sure even you're ex extra busy trying to figure out how to utilize that Zoom with your students, your P1. So I hope everything works out to your favor and everyone else's favor around the world. So we want to thank you for taking thank the time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed talking with you, Nima and Aaron. I hope that in a uh, better future era when we're going to meetings and traveling, I'll get to meet you in person. You know, it's such a small world in pharmacy. Uh, maybe someday that you're up here in the in Virginia or the Richmond area and uh, – you know, just the way pharmacy works, small world. Good luck to you on your exam on Friday. <laughs> thank you so much. We'll definitely visit. And thank you so much for everyone that was tuning in. My name is Nima. My name is Aaron. And thank you for accepting our invite.